here it goes. Here's I, I got it, the recording and process. So a process, <laughs> as I say, up here in Canada. So, um, so I'm Gail Hannon, just in case you couldn't tell us apart. And I'm Sherry Eberts. Uh, we are really thrilled uh, to be here with you tonight and talking about how you can live more skillfully with hearing loss. You know, we don't use the term skillfully lightly. As two women with hearing loss, we have learned the hard way that there is an easier way. We can become better at living well with hearing loss. We can become more skilled at getting the most out of any listening situation. And we can take charge and be in control of our hearing loss journey, not just as bystanders, but full active participants who deserve to hear and be heard. And we believe that a skills-based approach is gonna help any person with hearing loss, regardless of how long they've had it. And so this approach is what we're gonna talk about today. And it's based not only our, on our own personal experiences, but also on those of thousands of other people like us. And it's backed up by hearing science and incorporates modern hearing care principles, such as person-centered care. We have both been individually dedicated to this philosophy for many years because we've experienced the life-changing difference that it makes. So we put everything we know into our book, Here and Beyond, Live Skillfully with Hearing Loss. And it's really the book that we wish we'd had at the start of our hearing loss journeys. So tonight we're excited to share some of the highlights with you, but we're gonna start off and share a little bit more of our hearing loss stories. So I'm gonna go first because I'm older. Um, <laughs> I first became aware of my hearing loss when my mommy told me. Uh, she was a nurse who realized that her two-year-old daughter was either very stubborn or had something else going on. And the doctor confirmed congenital hearing loss of cause unknown. At my annual, annual, every single year trip to the pediatric ENT, the verdict was always the same. It's a little worse. Come back next year. Sorry, a hearing aid won't help. Luckily, my parents emphasized the importance of good communication and self-advocacy, which actually I wasn't so good at once I left home. But my teachers were always advised, but the only educational strategy that they could offer was for me to sit at the front of the class. I was a good student, but teachers had annoying habits such as turning their backs to me as they wrote on the blackboard and walking around the classroom as they talked. And I need then, and I need now, the basic rule of hearing loss, sit where you can see the lips. At 20, in a life-changing moment, I switched doctors and I had a hearing aid within a month. Life-changing. Over the next two decades, my hearing worsened, but I was able to depend on a succession of better hearing aids and useful speech reading skills. Unfortunately, I also became adept at bluffing my way through challenging listening situations. Looking back, I realized that I, I, I felt inferior. I was constantly embarrassed by mishears, saying the wrong thing, speaking too loudly, cutting people off. And then at 40, for the first time, I reached out to other people with hearing loss, another transformational decision. I was pregnant and I needed help to make sure that I wouldn't harm my baby because of my hearing loss. I attended a hearing loss conference and I walked in that conference one person and I walked out another. I was stunned to learn that I was not alone. I felt negative attitudes fall away. I became passionate about hearing loss advocacy and I started creating dramatic content, presentation, and I became involved with many different uh, projects and different organizations around the world. I became a writer. I've been writing for Hearing Health Matters for 11 years now published my first book, The Way I Hear It, in 2015, and now Here and Beyond with the incomparable Sherry Eberts. My hearing loss journey continues. Even now, I learn, and the more I learn, the better I communicate. So I first noticed my hearing loss in my mid-20s, but my journey really started well before that, watching my father struggle with his own hearing issues. 
And he was very stigmatized by it. He would do almost anything to keep it a secret. He even grew his hair, you know, long over his ears well after it was fashionable. I remember him at family parties. He'd often be found off by himself. And as a child, I didn't understand why. But when I developed my own hearing loss, I understood. He probably was having trouble hearing and he just couldn't bring himself to keep trying. We all know what that feels like. So when I first discovered my own hearing loss, I hid it too. I followed in his footsteps and I was embarrassed and shamed. And I'm not really sure why. I guess it was just the example that I saw in my home. And this lasted for many years. But once I had children, everything changed for me because I saw them watching me do the same things I had watched my father do, hiding my hearing loss and laughing at jokes I hadn't heard. And I realized I was passing on this stigma to another generation. My hearing loss is genetic. And so I worry that you know they may develop it as adults as well. So I decided this had to stop and I needed to accept my hearing loss. So finally I did. I started wearing my hearing aids all the time and started teaching my family and my friends how they could help me to communicate better. And I refused to let my hearing loss isolate me. It isn't always easy, but it's definitely always worth it. And now I'm an advocate for people like me. So I write a weekly blog at livingwithhearingloss.com and produced a hearing loss documentary with other advocates during the pandemic. And now, of course, writing here and beyond with awesome Gail Hannon. And so by sharing my story, I really hope to help others live more comfortably with their own hearing issues. So as you can see from our stories, there are some similarities and some differences and obviously some ups and downs. Just because you've been living with hearing loss for a long time doesn't mean you're necessarily good at it. But the amazing thing to me about our stories is that over the years and through trial and error and really by meeting and learning from other people with hearing loss, Gail and I each found our way to a similar set of skills and strategies that help us live it well with it. And when we talked about this with one another, what really became clear was the key was when we shifted our goal from hearing better to communicating better, that that made all the difference. It sure did. Let's talk about how you can live more skillfully with your hearing loss too. And the first step is understanding the big picture. You know, most of us don't start our journey with the big picture. And while hearing care professionals are crucial to setting the stage and laying the groundwork for our success, most of them do not provide it, not fully in the way that we need it. We need to see that hearing loss is, for most of us, permanent. It was only when looking back that Sherry and I realized the complicated journey that we were on. And that journey could have been so much easier if we had had that information in advance of poor knowledge about what was ahead and, and what to expect. For example, for most of us, hearing aids and cochlear implants are not a standalone cure. Our experience is that most people still rely on visual cues and other methods. The big picture can help us accept the emotions of hearing loss, something that's not talked about in the clinic as often as it should be. People communicate with emotions, which are normal. And we, ten, we need to know that we're not alone in feeling sad, angry, and maybe even embarrassed at communication that is now very difficult. The big picture shows us what to expect and that there is help and support available. And that asking for that support and accepting it is not helplessness, it's strategic. So we've spent a lot of time, Gail and I, talking with other people with hearing loss. And, you know, while every hearing loss is, is unique, every journey is unique, most people pass through a series of typical stages. And so we've laid those out for you here. And the first is debating with yourself. And this is where you wonder if you're having trouble hearing or, you know, is everyone else just mumbling? And this might be subconscious, you struggle with denial really looking for anything else to blame but your own poor hearing. And this stage can last up to 10 years for some people. 
Stage two is validating. And here's where you decide to get the facts and go for a hearing test. So a diagnosis of hearing loss might not be what you want, but now it's a reality. The third stage is taking charge. And this is really the most exciting part of the journey, but it's also the hardest. But this is when you decide to do something about it. And for most people, this means getting hearing aids, but you soon discover, like Gail said, they're not a standalone solution for hearing loss. So you begin to learn as much as you can about your own hearing loss, and you start to figure things out, what you need, an integrated set of mental, technical, and practical strategies that help you communicate better. And that's really the primary focus of Here and Beyond. Stage four is the ultimate goal, and that's when you're living skillfully. So you're open-minded about adopting a variety of strategies and technologies to help you with your daily communications. And it doesn't mean every day is smooth sailing, but you're able to handle any bumps in the road, adapt, try something new, and keep going. And then there's stage five, refreshing and restarting. And that's what makes the hearing loss experience a journey rather than a puzzle with a solution. So just when you think you have it all figured out, something changes, right? Your hearing aids need to be replaced or you may have had a change in your hearing level or a pandemic comes along and changes all the rules. So you might need to revisit a previous point in your journey and that's okay. It's a natural part of the process and it's just an opportunity to try something new and to become even more skillful. And these stages don't really happen overnight. They can be quick for some people, but they're more likely to stretch over years. And no matter your particular journey, we believe living skillfully is possible for almost everyone. The second part of living skillfully, I know there's a lot of lists, uh, but uh, I'm hoping that it makes sense to you. But the second part of living skillfully with hearing loss is adopting these strategies and skill sets. And they have a single targeted purpose to improve communication. This is the three-legged stool. So you know about three-legged stools, right? They never wobble, even on uneven ground. It's the solid foundation of communication that we can depend on. And these legs are mind shifts, technology, and communication game changers. Each of these skills, each of these legs is an important component of good communication. But when the three of them work together, magic happens. I have the potential to change my journey. The person with the most power in my hearing loss success is me. This, I think, is a very moving statement and really a life changing one because it's the moment you discover that you are in charge of your hearing loss journey. And a lot of that comes down to attitude. So we all know a hearing loss diagnosis can come with emotional burdens that put hearing loss as embarrassing or shameful or at the very least, something never to be discussed. And some of these beliefs come from external sources like advertisements and other media that are still using poor hearing to make someone look stupid or out of touch. And we can internalize these feelings, looking down on ourselves. Sometimes we feel like we need to hide our hearing loss so we don't appear weak or broken. So let's do an attitude selfie to reveal some common negative attitudes that people may hold about their hearing loss. So people often think, why me? Nobody understands what I'm going through. I want to hear better the way I used to. Oh, I, I don't like to advertise my hearing loss. People will think I'm older, slow. My family and friends always forget about it. Hearing aids are ugly and expensive and they don't always work. Well, I, I don't wanna bother anybody with my hearing loss needs. Who would wanna hire me or love me or be my friend? I get angry at myself and I get angry at others when they make communication mistakes. Everywhere I go, there is no access for people with hearing loss. 
our attitudes towards hearing loss affect our emotions and our behaviors. And this is a really powerful statement because it means that life with hearing loss can be different, better, just by changing our attitudes. And these better attitudes help us create better conversations because we're willing to ask for the assistance that we need. And they can even help our technology work better because we're more open to experimentation and change. Now, we're not trying to be overly simplistic here, right? Mind shifts are not cures for hearing loss, but when we actively support our hearing aids with other strategies, including an improved emotional attitude, we can communicate better. So Gail is gonna take us through a couple examples of this. Yeah, for example, um, the first one, the attitude is, nobody understands what I'm going through, something that we've all felt. And the mind shift for that is, Many people experience the same challenges as I do. I can learn from them. I'm not alone. I remember a defining moment of that uh, first hearing loss conference that I was telling you about. Um, on the final night, a few of us, my new hearing loss friends, we went to a nearby pub. And uh, the only other people in the pub but was one corner in the table with four people, presumably people who could hear. Now, let me tell you, there are few things louder on this earth than a group of people with hearing loss who have been drinking some wine and beer. We were loud, loud. I felt uncomfortable. I was conscious of the look we were getting from that other table in the corner. And then the aha moment, I thought to myself, so what, what does it matter? This is what having hearing loss is like. And that moment changed everything for me because my new hearing loss friends made me realize that I wasn't alone and it was more than okay to have hearing loss. You know, also fun. And the second one, the attitude is, I want to hear better the way I used to. And the shift is, I want to communicate better. And it takes more than hearing aid to do this. I must use other skills and additional technology. So three years later, after that aha moment in the bar, I was I started a speech reading instructor course, and it was the fire that lit my passion for hearing loss advocacy. So I had already stomped out the stigma thing three years before, but there was still much that had not changed that would take me beyond being totally dependent on hearing aids uh, and speech reading. There was so much more that I learned that I could do in this course. I learned, I improved my self-advocacy skills and that improved the conversation. And I discovered the amazing world of assistive technology. Okay, so we're back to our stool and we're gonna turn to the second leg of the stool, which is technology. And we all know technology can be intimidating. Remember that negative attitude that we saw in the attitude selfie. Hearing aids are ugly, expensive, and don't always work. So we need to reframe that attitude into something like what you see here. Technology is my friend. My devices let me hear sounds I had forgotten or had never heard before. They connect me to other people and the world. So why then are many people reluctant to adopt ear technology? I think part of the issue is that people don't always have the right expectations. They think hearing aids are going to work like glasses where you put them on and poof, your vision returns to normal. And we all know that that's not the case with hearing aids or really any hearing device at this point. They help us a lot, but they don't return our hearing to normal yet anyway. But this is what many people expect, and they don't know that hearing aids are not enough. Um, we also need things like branded accessories. Remote mics like Roger Pens are very helpful in noisy situations or when you need to bring the sound closer to your ears. Also, smartphone apps. My favorites are always the speech to text apps, and I really use them everywhere from Zoom calls to in person meetings. And I think the, uh, the auto captioning is actually pretty good. It's getting accurate, it's well-timed, and every day it gets better and better. External accommodations can also be life-enhancing tools. And neither Gail nor I had really ever heard of CART or a hearing loop before we went to our first hearing loss conventions. 
And we need to help others understand the life-changing power of these tools. And I don't want us to rule out over-the-counter devices. They probably won't work for most of us on this call since they're geared toward people with mild to moderate hearing loss. But I think they could make good backup devices. And I really hope that they will jumpstart innovation and reduce stigma. The more people using hearing devices, I think it's the better it is for, for all of us. And of course, no matter the device, our two must-have features are Bluetooth and T-coil. And we need both of them. Uh, Bluetooth provides streaming for phone calls and Zoom calls and movies. And then T-coils are needed to access the loop systems that are popping up in uh, more and more public places due to advocacy by HLA and others. So I think it's kind of an exciting time to have hearing loss. I get excited about the technology. But sometimes we need more than the technology, other strategies, the non-technical type. And that's going to take us to that third leg of the stool. So the mind shift is, I want to communicate better and it takes more than technology to, to do this. I must use softer skills too. These are communication game changers. You know, sometimes even small changes in communication behaviors can have a huge impact on the quality of conversation. Most people with hearing loss, I'm sure on this call, are, are most likely already using at least some of these tactics to some degree. Sometimes we don't even realize it. But what we do know is that even with our hearing aid, we struggle in some situations. So what are some of the things that we can do? I'm going to a few examples of what we talk about in the book. Self-identifying as having hearing loss. I'm, you know, don't hide it. Self-identify. It sounds simple, but you know, for some people, it's difficult. It may go against their private nature. They're, they're, they still have a stigma. Sometimes they don't even know the proper term to use. Well, guess what? Sherry and I, at least Sherry and I, we don't care what term people use to describe yourself. It doesn't matter. Hearing impaired, person with hearing loss, little deaf, I, we don't care. Far more important than the label you choose is to describe it is your decision to be open about your communication needs. Telling people that you have hearing loss is simply informing them of a fact. But even experienced people with hearing loss struggle from time to time with this. So, and if you do, we practice, uh, we recommend practicing. And remember, you have the right to hear and be heard. One of our mind shifts is being open about my hearing loss helped me communicate better. Trying to hide it leads to misunderstandings. Self-advocacy. When we advocate for ourselves, we are simply asking for what we need to have a good conversation with someone. People aren't mind readers. We need to tell them what we need and what we don't need. Uh, communication best practices should be the standard for both sides. You know, get my attention, face me, all those lovely important tips that are also extremely easy to forget in the moment. And sometimes reminders are necessary and be comfortable in asking for repeats. Because if we don't ask for what we need, what happens? We bluff, we zone out. Bluffing is what I call the evil twin of self-advocacy. Mm -hmm. Learning not to bluff is a communication behavior with positive impact. Um, I will admit it's almost impossible to stop doing it completely because we bluff for many reasons, you know, when conversations get away from us. Sometimes we even deliberately do it, but rather than becoming a better bluffer, why not become a better communicator? And we have now our favorite tool that uh, Sherry's gonna tell you about. Okay, we get really excited about this one, so you'll have to excuse us. <laughs> but um, here is our communication checklist that we think is gonna help in any communication situation. It's the it shows you what to do, take the steps to get better communication. So the first is hearing check. Can I understand what my communication partner is saying? And if the answer is yes, then hallelujah and you're done. But if no, you move on to evaluate. And here's where you think about what do you need to improve the situation? And these could be things in the environment like more light or a different seat but they could also be communication partner issues, like they need to speak louder or slower. And you can also take a look at your tech tools to see if an app or an accessory might help. 
The next part is to articulate your needs. And this is often the hardest part, telling others what you need from them. But we can't skip this step, obviously. We have to ask for what we need for better communication. Otherwise, we're not going to receive it. We need to learn to do this assertively, but not aggressively, because that really gets a better result. And keep in mind that articulating your needs benefits your communication partners too. So it's really a win-win for everybody. And then the last step is revise and remind. And this is kind of like refreshing and restarting on the hearing loss journey that we were talking about. So adjustments sometimes have to be made. Maybe a musician arrives and the noise level picks up or your communication partners slip back into their old speech, happen, uh, speech patterns, which happens a lot. So just reapply the steps when the listening situation changes, even if it's just to remind people of what was already suggested. So we think it's pretty simple and effective and with practice, it really does become second nature. Now, the final feature of skillful living is applying everything you know about the hearing loss journey and all the tools, the three-legged stool, and applying all of that to your life, every aspect of your life. And especially the important area, um, I'd say the most important thing in our lives is our relationships. And we actually spend a lot of time in the book talking about this because hearing loss slams its biggest fist into our communication-based relationships. Um, it, like new relationships, um, there's a filtering process unique to people with hearing loss. Nice person, check. Fun to be around, check. Intelligent, check. But for us, there's an extra question. Can I understand this person? If it's not a check, we might be in trouble, but with some effort, honesty, we might be able to you know, turn it around and communicate well. Existing relationships, we don't get to choose those. Um, we may have trouble understanding our family, our friends and colleagues, and they get frustrated with us. But there are ways to keep these relationships from getting too tense and dissolving. It's a combination of everything we've been talking about, the mind shift, the technology, changing our personal interactions, making them our partners in this. For example, Sherry and her family have had some highly charged, apparently, but very <laughs> rewarding focused family discussion to set ground rules for everything they do as a family on hikes and, and restaurants, for example. And in, in my house, technology has certainly saved my marriage on occasion. The hearing husband likes volume of the TV at a certain level. I need it at another. So. I use a TV streamer and he uses the normal volume control. The only problem was that I couldn't hear him very well while the show was on. So to get my attention, he started throwing a pillow at me. A pillow. That also nearly ended our marriage. Anyway, there's a hearing hack I suggested to him to help communicate uh, during the night when it's dark and I don't have my devices on. But that hearing husband of mine refused to wear glow in the dark lipstick. I tried. Now, a big hearing hack, and we have a lot of them in, in this book, as I mentioned, is to make partners out of the people in our lives. A support network doesn't just mean that people cheer you on and listen to your emotional rants. They may also offer some tough love and tell you truthfully how you're doing, and then vice versa, just as Sherry did as she sat down with her family. We can create these networks with everyone in our lives, especially, and not to forget our hearing care professional, because this is one of the most important relationships and supports to our journey with hearing loss. So I just wanna say thank you for your attention this evening, and we're looking forward to a great discussion. But we wanted to end with just this one last thought. Living skillfully with hearing loss is an ongoing process. And so for each of us, the journey continues and we invite you to take that journey with us. Yeah, thank you so much for having us this evening. Uh, for more information and or to discuss anything, please reach out to Sherry and me. Uh, we have listed our websites on this uh, slide and our email addresses. And again, we do wanna draw your attention to our book 
What's that for a sales pitch? Here and beyond, live skillfully with hearing loss. <laughs> and, you know, we wrote that during the pandemic. Uh, it sort of kept us going during the pandemic, took two years. And as Sherry said earlier, we have shared everything we know about living the best possible life. And we hope you'll find it useful. And just to request, if you have already read it, um, please write a review on Amazon or your favorite site. Reviews not only help, uh, they help jumpstart Amazon's algorithm. I don't understand it, but apparently, but it helps other people with hearing loss to find the book. And that's why we wrote this book for, for, for people who need to read it. So now we're happy to go to some discussion, take any questions you might have. Hey, thank you so much, Sherry and Gail. And uh, again, uh, for those of you who have not read their book, it's available for purchase at Amazon and other booksellers. And uh, during this 30 minutes, they've uh, hopefully whet your appetite. And uh, if you'd like to refresh your memory on some of the things they've said and many of the topics that they did not have time to discuss tonight, uh, please get a copy of the book. Um, so as, uh, as they said, uh, they'd both be happy to answer any questions you may have. Again, if you have a question, uh, please use the chat button, raise your hand, unmute your microphone, wait to be recognized and identify yourself. So we'll take any questions you have now and I will uh, look at what's in the chat room. Okay. Uh, the first question in the chat room, what does HCP stand for? We thought it stood for hearing care provider. Exactly. We, we wanted to have sort of an overarching term that we use because depending on where you live, you might not have access to an audiologist. You might have a hearing instrument specialist. So a hearing care professional or a hearing care provider is a little bit more of sort of an overarching term. Okay, um, I have a question. Uh, during COVID, it was obviously a, a great challenge uh, to people with hearing loss. Uh, it not only increased isolation, uh, but with the necessity to wear a face mask um, and not to interact with people, it, it created uh, more fears and frustrations and uh, some of the other things you talked about. Um, since the pandemic isn't over yet, uh, despite what some people have said, uh, what can we do to continue our ability to communicate during these challenging times? Yeah, I mean, that's a terrific question. And I think a lot of the things in the book really apply to that. Because the first thing we have to do is we have to let people know that we're having trouble hearing them and that we have hearing loss. Otherwise, how are they going to know and how are they going to, to help us? Um, so I think it's sort of overcoming that nervousness or that stigma and, and letting people know that we need the assistance and then asking for it in, a, in a, as nice a way as we, as we can. And I have found that most people are really eager to help and then using our technology, right? Not just our normal technology, our hearing aids, our cochlear implants, but a whole host of technology tools, whether it's a remote mic, whether it's a speech to text app, um, whether it's a hearing loop at a pharmacy counter. So it's just making use of all of those things. And then communication best practices and other communication game changers that help us figure out uh, behavioral things that we can do and our communication partners can do to ask for the help we need. The good news, if there's any good news, is I think that a lot of people who, you know, don't have hearing loss or who don't consider themselves having hearing loss also struggled in the pandemic. So hopefully there's a little bit more empathy <laughs> out there for our situation, given the challenges that we all faced um, with, the, with the masks and in the pandemic. I don't know, Gail, if you have anything to add to that. No, I agree that, that I was, that's what I was going to say, because oh, I, yeah, I found that it didn't take too long for people to realize the impact. Um, but I know for me personally, and I heard other people say this, that for those early days of the pandemic, I would, panic stricken. It threw us back to a time when we didn't have any of these tools. And I think it made me take stock 
of what I needed and to reassert that. Like it was very hard for me for the first two times in the grocery store to turn to my husband and say, what did they say? And I had to, you know, sort of refresh and remind myself of what I needed to do. So um, nowadays, because of you know, people don't, I had, I have hearing loss and people go, oh, no problem when you stand back, pull down the mask and, you know, it gets better. Okay. A couple of people have their electronic hand raised. So let's start with uh, Jerry in Colorado. Uh, you're I'm unmuted. I ran across something that has um, really helped a lot of people um, in the met when you're dealing with the medical profession is every time you set they want your name and your birthday, just automatically let it roll off your tongue that I have a hearing loss. And I don't care if they hear it a dozen times, that's better than not hearing it at all. And one of the times helps. And if you get used to doing it, it is not, it's not really a problem. It's easy. Okay, thank you. Any comment, uh, Shari or Gail? Uh, if, if not, we can uh, move on. Karen uh, Greenberg has a question. Uh, Karen, you've unmuted yourself. Yeah, thank you. Um, you know, I understand we have problems in restaurants. I recently went to a party at a restaurant and there were a lot of parties going on in this restaurant. My friends were very accommodating. They know I have a hearing problem or I mentioned that we came late and I was at the end of the table and there was about 10 people. They did move themselves around so I was able to sit close to the birthday girl, but I still find I'm single-sided hearing and I have phonak across and I just find that the hearing aid, especially on the microphone side, I have to take that off. I hear too much of the extraneous noise and it's still, to, everyone's talking at the same time. You can't concentrate and focus on any one conversation. And I do find what, I don't know the term you had used, fluffing or muffing? Muffing. Bluffing. Bluffing. It? Muffing? Bluffing. 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 Pretending you understand when oh. you haven't got a clue. Yeah. No, I don't bother <laughs> pretending. I just sort of go in the background. I just can't concentrate. And I avoid these situations where there's multiple people talking, even my book group, when we come to someone's house, everybody talks at the same time, too many different conversations going on. I guess I just have to keep repeating and I try to ask them, can we have one conversation at a time? It doesn't seem to work. Everyone thinks for themselves. Well, you know, you've just, uh, Karen described the uh, most impossible thing in the world and that's to to get a group of people to talk one at a time um <laughs> they they mean well and they want to but we respond instinctively to comments so um and sometimes when you say you avoid situations sometimes you have to say you know what a birthday party with 15 people in a restaurant it's just not really going to work for me so sometimes we have to maybe if we can be help choose the venue or we can choose the size of the event, take charge as, as much as we can. Um, but there are some things that, um, that do, that do, that aren't going to work under it's, um, the way it's set up, you know, in a restaurant noisy. So unless Sherry, you've got some super hearing hack. <laughs> Well, it's all of the hearing hacks. I mean, yes. that's that's what I saw my father do growing up is just isolate himself and go sit in the corner at these family events. And so I really try not to do that. And I know that it's not going to be perfect and it isn't perfect and it can be exhausting and it can be challenging and upsetting. But I guess I just try and force myself to get out there and do it and, and know that it's not going to be perfect. I'm not going to hear everything. I try and talk to the people who are on either side of me to the best of my ability and be, you know, try and be as comfortable as possible that if I didn't catch everything, it's still okay. And just keep reminding people, you know, sometimes I just like raise my hand when I want to speak and you know, hope it catches on. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And it's one of these things where, you know, 
I don't know, there's no perfect solution, but I, I would encourage everyone to just get out there because if you get yourself into that pattern of staying home and missing out, then that becomes your pattern. If you get yourself into the pattern, of going out, giving it a shot, knowing it's not gonna be perfect, you know what, you build skills, you build practice, you get better at it. So. I would encourage um, you and myself and all of us, you know, to just get out there and try. Thank you. Okay, uh, Marilyn Gordon has her hand up. Uh, Marilyn, if you could unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, no, Karen, I feel exactly the same way. It's very frustrating. Um, uh, yeah, forget, you know, go to lunch, count on hearing one person if they're facing you. But I find also in like house parties, you know, and, I, and I'm talking about adult party, you know, where it's conversation, you know, and there are this group of people, this group of people, this group of people having wonderful conversations. I can't understand any one of them because they're all distracting. I, I can't concentrate and I wind up leaving. And I really feel very deadly about it. Sometimes it's professional family things and I want to be part of it and I'm just not gonna understand. And I it's and and it's very desocializing. That's not a word, but you all understand what I mean by that. Um, I, I think people don't understand the general population who can hear, fortunately doesn't understand that this is very frustrating. I, I have a, a voice teacher who mumbles and I say, could you please, could you speak, please speak a little more loudly. He knows I've known him for six years that I'm hard of hearing and he will start yelling. And I said to him, don't yell at me, but speak more clearly to me. I don't make fun of you for wearing glasses. Don't make fun of me for being hard of hearing. You know, um, I think people just, people I think have become aware of, you know, because of masks that, you know, gee, you know, you don't always hear somebody. Anyway, I'm, I'm sorry, but it's like, I- I, I, have, I have come up with a new motto, especially to some of my friends. I say, I know I have a hearing problem, but you have a listening problem. Oh. <laughs> it's true. No one wants to listen. <laughs> hey, thanks, Marilyn. Uh, Rosalia has her hand up. Hi, good evening, I'm Rosalia. I just want to say to Gal, Gal and Sherry, thank you so much for writing this book. I could relate to every single sentence that you wrote. And, you know, I've been hearing impaired for over 20 years now. And this book is life changing because I wish I had it 20 years ago when I first started my journey. I had nothing. I just had my little audiologist, you know, down the block. And it was, it's been quite a journey over the years. But I have two pressing issues that I'm hoping that you could provide some guidance for me. Okay, so currently I stream um, the hearing from the hearing aids to, uh, you know, through Zoom on my hearing aids through the Bluetooth. Okay, I am looking for a laptop, not an iPad, where I can have it being compatible to my hearing aids on the Bluetooth. So I have not been able to find that. My husband, we just bought a Mac Air Pro, not compatible with my hearing aids, which I find shocking because it's an expensive device, but yet, the iPad is compatible with my hearing aid, which I find really frustrating because I really want a laptop. I don't want the iPad because I do a lot of Zoom meetings. So that's my, so I don't know if I should call the manufacturer of my hearing aids, which is Starkey, and find out if they can tell me if there's a laptop out there that compatible with my hearing aids because they're Bluetooth compatible. They're state of the art there. You know, they're pretty advanced, these hearing aids that I had. I'm just so frustrated because I do the Zoom meetings on my phone because that's the easiest thing for me because it goes right into the hearing aids and I hear it perfectly. Um, so that's my first issue. And then the second issue I have is 
I'm a runner and I have to wear the hearing aids when I run because I do marathons, I do a lot of races and I cannot wear them and sweat with them because they don't work. So I find that I have, I bought the sweat guards for the back of my ears. I can wear them for the first three miles, but if there's an emergency at the race, I just got to follow the crowd because I can't put the hearing aids back in because if they get wet, they don't work. So, uh, you know, it is such a difficult and frustrating journey, but your book has helped me so much because I am standing up for myself so much more now. You know, when we people say, uh, you know, when I tell them, I'm sorry, can you repeat that? I can't hear you. And they say, oh, don't, no problem. You know, it's no problem. And they say, Pl I want to hear what you're saying. Can you please repeat it? And it, it's a journey, but I find that speaking up for myself really has changed a lot. Um, but there are situations where when I get home, if I have to work hard at hearing, I come home exhausted because I'm just like, oh my God, that was a lot of work for me to <laughs> listen. Like people don't understand you have hearing loss, but you can't hear perfectly. So I've had people say, well, aren't, aren't you hearing aids in? I'm like, yes, but it's not the same. I feel like part of the process is educating other people because they think you have hearing aids, you should hear perfectly. And that's not the case at all. I mean, I can hear more than I did without them in, but it's not a perfect science. Um, and I think that's part of the process is educating people to let them know it's not perfect. You know, I still struggle hearing, even with the hear loss, hearing loss and the speech reading, it's still an issue. So if you can just provide me a little bit of feedback with the whole laptop thing. And if I could, if I should call the manufacturer Starkey and try to find out if there's a, um, a laptop that it can use with the hearing aids. I'm sorry it went on for too so long. I appreciate it. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, I'm so glad the book is having an impact like that. And good for you. Like, go for it. <laughs> good for you for standing up for yourself. Um, in terms of the laptop, I mean, maybe you've already done this, but I might start with Apple first because they do have really good assistance in their stores. You can make an appointment and they might be able to work with you to try and connect it because it is very surprising that it wouldn't. And then I think you've got to go to Starkey because I know I have Bluetooth things that I connect to my computer all the, all, you know, my laptop all the time. So it there might just be some kind of weird setting or some weird thing. So I wish I had the answer for you, but I think you need to go, you know, either to Apple or to, to Starkey or maybe both. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good uh, luck. Carolyn Tannen's next. And she was also nodding her head. I think she has some ideas on, on laptops. Carolyn, you're muted. Um, um, Speaking of the um, laptop, it's a connector, like a, a microphone clip or a microphone adapter that you could plug into your laptop and then turn on your T coil. Um, so that's an option. That that just in response to that. Um, I would I wanted to piggyback off from um, Gail when she was talking about being in the restaurant talking very loud. Um, I'm having that, that issue now with my family. Um, they, they just don't like it, you know, that I'm always talking loud in public. And I'm like, who cares what other people think? You know, you understand that I, I'm not doing it on purpose. You know, I, you know, so I have some people, friend of mine, hearing friend of mine, uh, my best friend, she don't care. They don't care about what other people think, you know. The only thing you have to worry about is the people that you're with, you know, and that they understand. You know, I would try not to worry about it, but, you know, it bothers people. <laughs> it, it does. The, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. I, I mean, <laughs> you know, there, there's no perfect answer, right? I mean, one thing is if you can just like I have a, a signal, you know, with your family. So like maybe they just yeah, like small fucking one map too. Make a little signal like a visuals. I think I think Melanie, you're not muted. Uh, you know, that way they can give you that information. 
in a less confrontational way. Maybe it won't make you feel so bad. And then you get the information and everybody moves on. You know, I don't know if that would really do it or not. Yeah. It's hurtful. You know, it's hurtful when your family, you feel like they're the ones that should understand and support yeah. you the most. And it's hard when sometimes they disappoint you and, and they do. I yeah. just try to yeah. remember, you know, the, the times when they don't. Right, because they're you're around them the most, so they have the most opportunities to disappoint. Obviously. I think that we, because during the pandemic, I was relying on yeah. a family member because of the math, you know, being in public, and it got to become burdensome, you know. And you know, hopefully now that things are get, um, getting better, you know, things will change. Yeah. yeah. By the way, I have the book. <laughs> I didn't read it yet. Um, I will pick, put it in my bag, and I'm taking. I'm commuting again now, so I'll read it on the train. <laughs> awesome! Thank That's you. Great presentation. Thank you. Hey, Arlene Romoff has a question. Hi. Yeah. Uh, thank you. This is great to finally uh, see you and get to chat a little bit. I wasn't able to go to the HLA convention. I missed that. But of course, I bought your book immediately. I think, yeah, it was back, you know, the initial order. So I, I had to have it. And I just want to say I'm, I'm no novice to hearing loss. Uh, I go back um, 50 years as an adult. I, <laughs> but I lost my hearing starting at around age 20 for 25 years before cochlear implants were on the scene. And then I went to cochlear implants. So 25 years of each. And what you write about was so needed to be written about. You know that, of course, I wrote two books on my cochlear implant experience, but the focus was not on what you were doing. And I would say the more books about hearing loss there are, the more validating it is, because you know there are very few out there. There really are. And it just needed to be said listening to some of the people here. Uh, and my, my family has always been supportive. And so when I hear about family members not wanting to help, maybe I was spoiled, but I started losing my hearing when I, right after I got married. And my husband, as my hearing progressed, we, he knew I would make a, you know, just, he would know, the one I needed help, you know, so, uh, so he was a banker and I accompanied him. So if I was in a situation where I held on, no idea what's going on, and he would very, uh, you know, calmly and just uh, politely just know and help me along. Of course, I could lip read him 100% eventually, but I realize now my daughter, who always had a mommy with hearing loss, and now she's a mommy of her own. When she's with me, she reverts to helping mommy hear. And she interprets what her kids are saying, because kids are very hard to hear or to understand. So uh, my point here is that family members can be very supportive. They can be helpful. They, it's not that you're, you need to do everything yourself. Why should you, if they are there to help? You can have energy to do something else. They can be there and assist. So they can make that phone call if it's too hard for you to do. You know you can do it yourself. So yeah, that's my words of wisdom. And I really appreciate that. Uh, you know, everybody shares their family relationships. But I just wanted to say there can be very good ones. So I know just one other thing, like I'm alone now. My husband passed away now 10 years. Um, so I go to appointments on my own and sitting in the doctor's office, are they gonna yell out your name and you're gonna get missed, okay? <laughs> you know, and of course you tell them, I am gonna sit here and not let you forget about me. Okay, well, I had one of those appointments where you needed to have somebody come with you details don't matter so I had my daughter with me and would you know she was sitting there I was just totally relaxed 
totally relaxed, like you didn't have to use all your wits about you. And so I know that's what you wrote about. And that's, that's what the reality is. So thank you so much. And thank you for letting me vent a little bit. It's, uh, it's a journey. But let me tell you what you're describing here, cochlear implants and Bluetooth and automated captions and all this stuff. Believe me, don't complain about having to use that. Just imagine what it's like if you didn't have all this stuff. I had one microphone that was a wire to my hearing aid and that's your equivalent of your uh, Roger Selects and all those. You use all that stuff, become familiar with it. Okay, I could talk forever, you know that. So thanks very much. Thanks, Arlene. A couple you. of questions in the uh, chat room. Uh, one is I have live transcribe for my Android phone. What are similar apps for iPhones? Uh, I know Otter. Spelt it right, O T T E R. Uh, is anyone familiar with other transcription apps they've used, uh, either for cell phones or laptops that work well? Gail, you're muted. Apology, apology. I like NAL Scribe, National Acoustic Laboratory Scribe, just because the, the print is, is really good. Um, but I also like Otter as well. Um, and um, there are just so many new apps out right now, um, but, but those are the two that I use. Yeah, and one thing that just came out on the new iOS, and I haven't really even had a chance to test it yet, is that there's something that they're calling, I, I think it's live trans, I forget what it is, they all sound the same, but it's basically built into the accessibility area of the iPhone, similar to the way it's built into Android phones. So it's in beta right now, but it's going to be able to give you automatic captioning on Facebook and also on you know, other aspects of your phone when you're making phone calls. So the good news is, you know, it's coming, right? It's getting better, like Arlene said, right? Like it's just, it's getting better and better. So that's something that's definitely worth looking into. It's still in beta right now, um, but eventually that'll be there too. Fantastic. I know uh, Apple's been doing a lot of work on their iPhones uh, on, on health issues. And uh, you don't have to have their latest phone to use many of them. If you update your software, you will have access to them. Um, another question in the chat box, uh, have you worked with anyone or do you know uh, any hearing loss professionals who work with people when hearing loss is attributed to cranial radiation following removal of a brain tumor? And there is also cognitive damage. Oh, goodness. I'm not able to comment on that. I'm sorry. Yeah. Okay. I think you need to uh, to speak your to your ENT about that um, would probably be the best source. Yes. Um, I'm just looking at other uh, some comments. AVA is another app for smartphone captioning. AVA um, uh, laptop compatibility made for iPhone hearing aids were designed to work with Apple products. Uh, there are workarounds. You could use external speakers uh, with your laptop and you could put your mini mic in front of the speakers. Uh, there may be adapters that you can use to connect with your laptop. So I think it's a great suggestion. If you have an Apple product, go into the Apple store. If you have another product, uh, try to contact your uh, manufacturer. Uh, just looking to see, uh, Charles Cantor has his hand up. If you could uh, unmute, Charles. How you doing? I'd like to comment uh, on the iPhone new updated software, which includes a built-in uh, captioning. I've been fooling around with it for the last couple of days mm -hmm. because the update just came to me uh, two days ago. And I can tell you that it is absolutely terrific. Everybody should try it. Uh, 
in the iPhone, it would not be an added app. It would be a built-in feature. And I find it much easier to use and uses much less broadband uh, on the phone. So try it. Thank you, Charles. That's awesome. And I, I saw that Sherry Perizzoli put in the chat that, that it's called Live Listen. So I was not, I think I, I said the wrong name. So thank you for that, Sherry. Yeah. Okay, I'm looking to see if there are any other questions, hands raised or in the chat. Um, if I can just jump in, I want to do a shout out to my girls, Karen and Judy there. It's so great to see you. Um, I just have a, a quick funny story from a couple of conferences ago. Uh, Judy says, I have your book and I haven't read it, but I have your book. It's upstairs. And before I came downstairs, I just opened it up and right in the middle. And what I read was, hey there, if you haven't started at the beginning of the book, you just go right back to the beginning and start reading. And she went, hello, God. You know, she was like, ooh. And sure enough, I went, oh, I don't remember that. But sure enough, it was in chapter whatever, chapter six. And it, it's, I said, um, if you're just starting here, you're not going to understand what I'm talking about. You have to go back to the beginning and start from the beginning of the book. Um, well, actually, and Sherry and I have said about um, Here and Beyond, you could sort of pick it up and open it anywhere. And it's a book that you can read in bits, um, although we do recommend starting at the beginning, um, yeah, but you can do whatever you like. So I just want to say hi to my girls there. Yeah. It's, it's nice to see Karen and Judy. Uh, they were with us at the New York State Conference in Lake George, and we heard some uh, terrific presentations up there as well. Um, one of which reminds me uh, of your statement uh, that hearing loss does not have to define us um, it's only one aspect of, of who we are. So I know certain people uh, express the opinion that hearing loss is an advantage. Uh, it helps them in their lives and uh, it's certainly a challenge, uh, but it's one that can be overcome. So uh, if there are no other questions, uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank Sherry and Gail for joining us this evening. Uh, we promise to draw a name from the hat for a free copy of, of Here and Beyond. And uh, we did that earlier today. And the winner of that drawing uh, is Donald Gottfried. And uh, Donald will mail you a copy of the book. So if you liked what you heard tonight, uh, we invite you to join us for a future meeting or social event, which you can find listed on uh, HLA's website, uh, hlawestchester.org. Go watch for event flyers in your uh, email box. Our next chapter meeting takes place in person on Saturday, October 22nd at the Irvington New York Library. Our very own Leslie Weiss and her trusted hearing dog companion, Trenton, will give you a fascinating demonstration about hearing dogs and how they may benefit you. Uh, on Saturday, November 19th, we will hold a defensive driving course uh, together with uh, AAA that can save you money on your auto insurance premiums and reduce points for any violations. Uh, this event will also be held at the Irvington Library. So uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. Um, if you'd like to stay on the line, we will have a socializing period, anything you uh, wish to discuss. Uh, if not, uh, I'd like to wish all of our Jewish friends a happy and healthy new year. Uh, and again, uh, thanks so much, uh, Gail uh, and Shari. Well, thank you. We just want to say thank you for inviting us. It's always a joy. Um, and thank you for those who have given us great feedback on the book. And just uh, um, a, a plea from us that um, please get those reviews on Amazon because it helps other people. And that's what we want to do. So thank you so much. Thank you so much. I just thank you. Would, would anyone else like to speak? But yes. Hi. <laughs> I finally got a microphone and a camera. I just. I got home just before the start and I wasn't set up yet. Uh, I wanted to mention that uh, I noticed in the transcript uh, you mentioned the uh, New York State Conference we just had. If you want to see the pictures of it, there's uh, there's about uh, over 100 pictures. It's on the 
hearinglossnys.org. Right, on Facebook. And the, it's the, the drop down mm -hmm. under the New York State Conference. And, and then the, on that page, there's a pointer to where all the pictures are. And uh, there's pictures of Justin uh, playing his violin and all that other stuff. And uh, yeah, it's a pretty good uh, recap of, of the whole c convention. So uh, appreciate you showing up for that, by the way. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you, thank you both for sending those pictures. I posted it on the website yesterday. So everyone take a look at the pictures. They're fabulous. And uh, I was gonna mention somewhere along the line, uh, when I'm at a store where uh, we're having a communications problem, I, I pull out my live transcribe and it uh, starts translating what I, I'm saying and what the clerk is saying and he later he said, Wow, how did you do that? It's really cool. <laughs> see, see. Yes, Carol. Um, um, I heard, I got an email from Justin today. I did as well. Yes, and um, he's putting me in touch with that woman in Long Island. I have a, a, a call with her tomorrow morning. Okay, do you want to join me on a call? I have a scheduled call with Debbie at 10 a.m. Oh, I, I'm at 10.30. Okay. If you want to text me your number and can join me at 10, um, we're going to oh, be talking I don't, about... I don't, I, don't, I don't think it's necessary for both of us to do it separately. Okay. We have that right. scholarship you want me money. To text, for... You want me to text you my number? And what, what kind of a call are you doing? Do uh, what they time. Okay. This might not interest everyone, but we have a... Uh, a grant for a, a, a child who needs hearing aids or related services. Uh, the chapters match that grant and, uh, and uh, the, the New York uh, the state chapter uh, of Justin Osmond's foundation uh, is gonna look into helping us with that. So what, what kind of a call are you doing? FaceTime or Zoom? Um, just a regular phone call, I believe. Oh, okay. I'm doing. Uh, I, I'm gonna do a video call with her. Okay. Why don't you do that? I'll mention you're coming on later, and we'll compare notes after our calls. How's that? But I won't do a voice call. Okay. Understood. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Again, it's so great to see everyone. Some new faces from around the country. Uh, someone in San Diego asked where we were. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Westchester County is about 30 minutes north of New York City, and uh, we love it here. So uh, hopefully you can join us for future meetings, and we look forward to joining other chapter meetings as well uh, that are publicized through the leaders group, as well as on the uh, HLA national uh, meeting calendar. So Carolyn, you have your hand up again? Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right, great. If no one... Robert? Oh, Simone, hi. Oh, you're waving. Hi, back. Tom, I know you're at that fabulous hotel in Lake George, I believe. Enjoy the rest of your stay, but be sure to come back. We need you. We'll call next time. Next time. Okay, I'm going to turn off the recording now if I find it. And uh, you're free to leave. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Hi, uh, thank Good you. Night. So how are you doing, Debbie? I'm doing much better, thank you. We Good. missed you up in Lake George. Miss I you. know, I, we missed you too, we missed you too. But thank you, Carolyn, thank you. Um, it, it actually was a great concert. I know um, it was. I, I kept hearing from Dan and Steve the, the entire time, so. Yeah, oh, you, you were on the um the I Goom? was on the Goom, yeah. Okay. It worked out fine, yeah, it worked I'm, out fine. I'm still on cloud nine from the meeting. I mean, the whole thing was unbelievable. Yeah, so I heard. Yep. I'm glad and it it'll, worked out. It'll be available on a Zoom recording very soon. And, and it's good to hear the pictures have been posted up. I've been sending some individual ones around. Right, right. Great. I think okay, I hit... thank you. Okay, okay good night, I'm going to go. I, I, I went started a new fitness class at the Bronxville High School.
So um, I, I haven't had a chance to eat anything. I don't know if I want to eat this week, but all right. Um, I'll talk to you soon. Um, Steve, I'll be in touch. Okay. Okay. Good night, everyone. Have fun, everyone. Have fun. <laughs>